So good afternoon, everybody. Caroline and I are going to be talking about early women barristers as public legal educators. So the history of women lawyers in the United Kingdom is barely a century old, although the history of women in legal education is significantly longer. When the Sex Disqualification Removal Act of 1919 ended centuries of exclusion, women immediately began the process of qualifying as barristers, solicitors, attorneys and advocates. However, many had already been preparing for years. The first woman lawyer in the UK, Madge Easton Anderson, was admitted as a law agent in Scotland in 1920. She had a law degree and had also worked as a legal apprentice while studying. The first barristers, Francis Kyle and Avril Deverell, were called to the bar in Dublin and Belfast in 1921. Both had LLBs from Trinity College Dublin. The first woman called to the bar in England and Wales, Ivy Williams, herself taught law at Oxford University. In fact, she chose to continue her distinguished academic career after call rather than practising. However, this paper is about a different type of legal education, not teaching and learning within the law school, but public legal education. So the 1919 Act came a year after the Representation of the People Act, which gave some women the right to vote and many of the first women lawyers had also been part of the women's suffrage campaigns. That political background gave at least some of them a different purpose and perspective. They were not only lawyers as a matter of personal interest and ambition, but also to a greater or lesser extent, extent as activists for women's rights in the legal and political spheres. In consequence, they felt that their role was wider than advising individual clients they also had a broader mission to educate the public and particularly the female public. As Helen has just explained, that was somewhat in tune with the times as well, and in particular with the idea of public legal education having a role in a broader civic education. That was the perspective of one of the first women barristers um, Ethel Bright Ashford, and I'm sorry, I'm having a slight issue where it doesn't want to move my slide. There we go. <laughs> um, so Ethel Bright Ashford's engagement with the suffrage campaigns was slightly a slant of the main suffrage movements, um, focused not so much upon obtaining the vote as upon educating women to use their new political rights well. She was the daughter of a self-made businessman who had moved from commercial traveller and warehouseman to owner of his own hosiery manufacturing company. While she didn't explicitly acknowledge that background in later life, um, she seems to have been a little embarrassed by the uh, ladies' undergarments, it may be that uncertain class background which helped to shape her own political ideas, um, which were an interesting combination of individualism and civic duty. Ashford's own education had included postgraduate qualifications in social work and economics. Indeed, she later said that it was social work which led her to the legal profession. She was one of the first students on Birmingham University's social work diploma attending Woodbrook College and her course included the British Constitution and English local government, which seemed to have been formative in shaping her future interests. She went on to study public administration at the LSC, as well as history and industrial conditions at Bryn Mawr in the United States. By the time she became involved in suffrage activism then, her particular interests had been formed. They focused upon civic education and local government, with the law one key component of these rather than her exclusive interest. She went on to work as a factory inspector before, later in the First World War, taking over management of her family business, as well as becoming involved in the Women's Municipal Party. And it was as, as an activist for the latter organisation that with Edith Place, she wrote a handbook on local government published in 1918. By contrast, Helena Normanton had a specifically legal origin myth to explain her interest in the bar. 
She told the story of how, age 12, <clears throat> she had accompanied her mother to an appointment with her solicitor about a mortgage. The lawyer patronised his client, Normanton's mother, suggesting that her young daughter understood the legal is issue even if she did not. Normanton did indeed understand and he called her quite the little lawyer. Thus, Normanton positioned the desire for women to understand the law so that they would not be similarly patronised by men as fundamental to her view of the lawyer's role. As she expressly stated, she did not want to see women getting the worst end of any deal for lack of a little elementary knowledge. Since the legal profession was close to women when she had to start earning her living, she had pursued a career in teaching from 1903, albeit without the passion she felt for the law, and therefore combined experience as an educator with her legal interests and ambitions. Her political background also differed from Ashford's. She had been an active suffrage campaigner, engaging with the more radical suffragette movement, whose focus was upon women's rights to engage in national politics. Thus, both women saw the law not as the exclusive preserve of lawyers, but as something to be communicated to the public and particularly communicated to women. It was almost inevitable, therefore, that they would engage in legal education. Nonetheless, their different backgrounds, interests and politics took the women in very different directions. For Ashford, women's civic education was the priority. As well as her work for the Women's Municipal Party, she was elected as councillor to Marlebone Borough Council in London in 1919. And she led the Marlebone branch of the Women's Citizen Association for several decades. Um, organising a programme of talks and discussions on topics such as citizenship, housing and women and children. Also in 1919, she taught on citizenship and public speaking at the Summer School of Civics and Eugenics in Cambridge, organised by the Civic and Moral Education League and the Eugenics Education Society as something which may horrify us today, but was very much in the progressive mainstream at the time. It was organised with the cooperation of the feminist National Union of Societies for Equal Citizenship. Her wider civic interest centred around her involvement in two bodies, the Scarpa Society for the Prevention of Disfigurement in Town and Country, a constituent body of the Council for the Protection of Rural England, and later the London Society. Both organisations were concerned with the public environment and part of that work for Ashford was the production of legal texts for a relatively specialised public of local authorities, civic societies and so forth. For example, her 1923 book, Rural Refuse and Its Disposal, was published by the Scarpa Society. Six years later came Local Government, a simple treatise, published by the National Union of Ratepayers Associations. That crossed over with her developing legal practice, also in local government law. Another crossover between her political and civic interests and her legal practice led to her engaging in more general public legal education through talks to a range of women's organisations. Topics varied widely, but to give a flavour, they included a talk on rates and taxes to the Aylesbury and Walton Women's Citizens Association in 1923, a lecture in 1932 on the right to Rome in support of the campaign to preserve public access to Glastonbury Tor, a 1936 talk to women in Chesterfield on a day in the law courts, a 1937 speech to Hull Women's Luncheon Club on women in the law, which covered legal, the legal profession and the experiences of women lawyers, and to talk on women and finance to the Devon Council of Women in 1931. So Helena Normanton also spoke to and wrote for lame women, but her interests were focused more squarely upon addressing a broad general public. It was then no surprise that one of her main publications was the 1932 book, Everyday Law for Women, taking an English female creature in her journey from cradle to grave upon a sort of aerial voyage over the terrain of her country's laws 
so far as they are most likely to affect her. Like Ashford, Normanton had the time to engage in further writing because her bar practice was by no means all consuming. It was also then a useful source of income to supplement her relatively meagre legal fees, although everyday law proved disappointing on that score. One of her most lucrative and controversial articles was an account of Wallace Simpson, future wife of King Edward VIII, who Normanton had met and sympathised with. Normanton also thought that they were vaguely related. That article sold for £3,000 and was published by the New York Times. However, that does not mean that it was only a financial exercise. That article was rooted in her wider work for marriage law reform. It was one of a large number of magazine articles, many of which addressed issues of public legal education, including legitimacy, marriage and divorce, pensions, criminal law and child offenders. These articles appeared regularly in magazines such as Good Housekeeping, Women Magazine, the Pall Mall Gazette, the Quiver and more sporadically in other journals. Other publications, such as her true crime books in the famous trial series on uh, murderers such as Norman Thorne and A. A. Rouse, were more clearly financially driven. But in 1932, she continued to identify her motivation for legal work as the need to address women's unmet legal needs. She wrote, women often say that they cannot get a man lawyer to understand what their real grievance is. Something has gone wrong with their marriage and they are not able to convince a man as to the cruelty of the case. Thus the bar and the bench may have needed educating on women's lives, just as women needed educating upon the law. So what then is the significance of these women's involvement in public legal education? The considerable differences between them point both to the diversity of activities encompassed and the difficulties of making generalisations. Other women barristers, for example, did not share this enthusiasm for public engagement, particularly younger women who hadn't been in actively involved with feminist campaigning before entering the profession, such as Monica Geeky Cobb, the first woman to hold a brief in court and probably the most successful of England's first women barristers. But we've seen that even Ashford and Normanton, who shared a determination to engage the public, did so in different ways and from different motivations. The contrast in their approaches can perhaps be encapsulated by comparing Ashford's strong focus on civic duty with the reviewer's criticism of Normanton's everyday law that it paid too much attention to the details of women's rights and too little to their civic duties. However, some common points are worth making. The political and pioneering nature of their roots into the legal profession meant that both women saw the law as more than a job or individual occupation. For both of them, albeit in different ways, educating the public about the law was a natural extension of, or even precursor to, their other legal activity. It was also a source of income, a significant one for Normanton, who effectively had a parallel career as a writer, and probably a lesser one for Ashford, who likely received little more than expenses for many of her speaking engagements. It was also influenced by their earlier lives when women's access to legal knowledge was constrained both by the closure of the profession to them and by barriers to women's wider civic participation. So while their methods and motivations differed, Ashford and Normanton shared a fundamental sense of legal knowledge as something which would benefit other women and which they had a duty to share. That gave a distinct flavour to their activities, which is specific to their period and perhaps their generation, but which also highlighted features of public legal education and its value, which continue to remain relevant today. <laughs>